We're going to start by deploying a PyGrid domain, the main database and API for our PyGrid deployment. We'll be doing it on Azure, so we want to start by ensuring that there are no resources currently deployed. From there, we're going to begin by installing the CLI using the pip install command. And once we have this, we can actually run the deployment script itself. It'll ask us a few basic questions related to the type of deployment that we would like to do, as well as the ability to set up any security credentials. We'll also be able to select the region in which we would like to deploy, as well as the initial machine type that we would like to deploy. Don't worry, if you would like to load balance this, we can also do so later. We'll set a username for the database as well as a password. Confirm that. And then make sure that our configuration is correct before actually running the deployment script. Typically, this process takes about one to two minutes, but we're going to go ahead and speed this up. And it looks like it was completed. We have a deployment IP address. And we can now go back to our Azure dashboard and indeed verify that everything has been set up. Everything from the actual PyGrid domain itself, as well as the VPC, is available on Azure. And we can confirm this by going to the IP address in our browser. Now that we've deployed our domain, we'll go ahead and proceed with the setup process. Like most things, this can be done in two ways, either using a user interface or by using a Jupyter Notebook. To start, we'll actually be using the user interface called PyGrid Admin UI. You can see that by starting, we're going ahead and setting up a token to be used throughout the remainder of the setup process. This is given to us from the deployment. We will then also set up the PyGrid owner's email and password. This can be used for any sort of administrative tasks. And then we'll also set up any remaining settings. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is just what we have so far for the initial setup process. As such, we'll be asked to sign in as the owner for the first time. and we will be directed to our dashboard. We can now begin uploading a data set. While there are going to be many data loaders eventually supported for PyGrid, the first one we'll show is just by simply uploading a tarred file that we can then unzip behind the scenes. And we can see that our data set was successfully uploaded. We can click into it to view any sort of manifest or description or tagging information, as well as to actually view the data and the tensors contained within the data set, as well as their various shapes and IDs. Lastly, we're going to start by creating a data compliance officer. Typically, this is a role that we suggest uh, include very low sets of privileges, and primarily be used for just triaging uh, data in tensor download requests. And as previously stated, we can also do this exact same workflow with a Jupyter Notebook. We'll show how this works, but keep in mind that this is redundant if you've already done this from the user interface. We'll be doing a temporary domain authentication where we do not actually supply any form of credentials for verification. And then once we've connected to the domain, we will actually run the setup command that you can see here. This will include the same information that you saw on the UI previously. Now that the setup process has been completed, we will go ahead and log in as the owner, just as we did previously. And we will also upload a data set. 
which we are referencing in the local file structure of our computer. And then we can actually view what this data set looks like. Finally, we're going to create the data compliance officer. If we would like, we can go ahead and inspect all the available roles with which we can create a user account from, and also see the various permissions that are associated with these roles. If you would like to add or remove or rename or re-permission any sort of roles, you may do so. We can see that the user has been created successfully, and we will now confirm this by asking to output all of the users of the domain. And we can see both the original data owner as well as the data compliance officer user accounts there in the table. We'll now move on to creating a data scientist. As previously done, this can be in two ways, either by the data owner creating a data scientist by the admin dashboard user interface. We'll do that one first. We'll begin by logging in as the owner. This person actually has the permissions to be able to create users. And then just as we did before, we will go and we will add the user. Keep in mind that the role user itself on PyGrid indeed defaults to being a very low permission individual. This is perfect for data scientists. Alternately, you can allow a data scientist to be able to create an account for themselves via a Jupyter Notebook. In future versions, we hope to allow for various permissioning schemes, perhaps in the form of an uh, acceptance criteria on behalf of the data owner or a data compliance officer who can accept such requests, or the ability to outright block users from creating their own accounts. We can now move on to the data scientist workflow. From this point forward, everything is going to be done from the vantage point of the data scientist. So we're switching sides right now. We'll go ahead and log in using our data scientist account. And we will begin by looking at all of the data sets currently available on the domain. Here we can see just the one that we've uploaded so far. We can then reference this data set via its ID and store it in a variable called remote underscore data set. And then if we would like, we can now print the manifest of this data set, as well as view the contents of the data set itself. Keep in mind, we're not viewing any data inside of the data set. We're merely just viewing metadata about the structure of the data set itself. We'll go ahead and also transition to now pre-training a model. This will be done quite quickly, but of course, in a typical data science workflow, this would take a significantly greater amount of time. And we can see that we've got a basic plot of our accuracy and loss. We'll now transition to creating a worker. A worker is where all of the work gets performed. So any sort of data science code that you would like to run on private data, you can do so inside of a worker. A domain is merely a permissioning system that can deploy workers from a data scientist. So right now, we're looking at all of the available instances that we're able to deploy to the Azure infrastructure hosted by the data owner. It looks like we found a machine that is going to work well for us. And we'll begin by actually creating that worker via the domain. Don't worry, this could take some time. We'll go ahead and speed this up. It looks like the worker has been created successfully. And we can now confirm this by viewing all of the workers that we have deployed as a user to this domain. 
Now that we've verified that our worker has indeed been deployed, we can create a variable to reference that worker in the future. We'll go ahead and grab the ID field and then plug it in and store it in a variable called worker. At this point, we can actually send our model to the worker. And we'll be able to reference the model via the pointer to the model called remote underscore model. We can then load the data set into the worker as well. We do this using a similar method called load. We'll specify two parameters. One is a pointer to the actual file in the remote data set that we would like to load. And then the other is the address of the worker that we have deployed. We can indeed confirm that this has been moved into the memory of the worker by running the worker.store.pandas command. And we can see our pointer there. At this point, we can actually perform the remote inference and get back a predicted value. We do this by passing the feature into the remote model pointer that we have. And then we can actually add some DP noise to the evaluation result. We'll store this in a variable called ACC for accuracy. We'll import the PyDP library that OpenMind also develops and we'll reference the bounded mean algorithm to get a mean of our pointer to our accuracy and store the result in ACC underscore result. And we can save this value to the domain so that we can shut down our worker and quit paying for it. At the end, we'd like to go ahead and request the ability to download the resulting value, which we cannot currently inspect, or dot .git. We'll look at all of the variables in the store of the domain, and we can now see our float value for our accuracy there at the end. We will then copy that ID and make sure to create a accuracy pointer variable relative to that item in the store that we can reference. And then we can actually use that variable to perform the request method and supply a reason this will show up for the data owner or the data compliance officer in order to allow them to have some extra information with which to make their decision. Switching over to the data compliance officer workflow, we can again complete this in one of two ways, either through the user interface, which we'll show first, or a Jupyter Notebook. As a data compliance officer, we'll log into the same PyGrid domain interface that we displayed earlier for the owner. We'll inspect our data sets and see that there is a current outstanding request. We'll be able to view some more information as well as view the request reason that was submitted by the data scientist. And once we're happy with this, we can either decline or accept the request. Now we'll do the exact same thing from a Jupyter Notebook. We'll start by setting up our environment, connecting to the domain as a data compliance officer, and then requesting to view all of the active requests on the domain. We'll see that there's currently one outstanding request, and we can see the reason. And then at this point, we will go ahead and reference our request, and we will call the accept method to accept the request. Finally, we go back to the data scientist one last time to download the result. All we have to do here is reference our accuracy pointer that we requested earlier, and we can finally call .git. And we can see the value of the accuracy of our model inference uh, with appropriate DP noise applied.